All right, so if you're sensing some agitation, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's real. Um, and, and what it is is uh, many of you saw the, the um, memorial that Lauren did for our, our late friend Marty Keel, uh, who founded Feminists for Animal Rights and who worked for years, for years, to try and get basic things like what Lisa mentioned about the special subordination of female form, farmed animals into this conference, onto the podiums, in the plenaries. Uh, Lauren and I both skipped one year. I, I've gone two years and we've gone backwards in terms of, of, of any attention at all uh, to sex, any attention at all to race. And, and it's just very distressing. Um, and I've been really thinking in terms of what I was going to say today about, well, well, well why then? What, 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 what is our, what, what is, what's the hold up here? How come every time Lauren or I or Marty or others talk about these issues, the room explodes in applause and then nothing changes? Because it's four o'clock on a Sunday. <laughs> yes. Okay, but let me think, I think I might know a little bit about why and what we can do because this is really essential, okay? Uh, 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 back in uh, the uh, 70s, uh, 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 black feminists started to articulate, who were working in both the civil rights movement, which wasn't paying attention to sex, and in the feminist movement, which was not paying adequate attention uh, to race, uh, uh, developed both a theory and a praxis that's called intersectionality. Uh, it's this idea. Uh, uh, it started out, we, we were just thinking mostly about racism and sexism and class and how they intersected and how we couldn't see those things as three separate things, but we had to see that they intersect. Not just one plus the other, it's actually more like one times the other. They compound one another. Uh, furthermore, they spring from the same roots. They not just use the same tactics, but they have the same uh, patterns of thought and patterns of behavior behind them, okay? And so, so first, it was uh, black feminist scholars like Kimberly Crenshaw who articulated this idea of intersectionality. It was mostly around race, sex, and class, some attention to sexual orientation. Now, before we move on to how we extend that out, a key piece of this is that when we understand the intersection of oppressions, what we understand is that Almost all of us, except for outliers on one end or the other, almost all of us are in some kind of mixed position on the matrix of oppression. Y'all were shouting out when Lisa asked you to. And so when we start to think about race and sex and class and sexual orientation and disability and immigration status and we could go on. Then, and we think about it, we find out that almost all of us are in some degree in the oppressed position on one or another of our identity constructs and in the oppressor position in the others. And it is very difficult to acknowledge this side of it when you're on the upside, right? You're, you're keyed into the ways that you're exploited. You're keyed into the ways that you're oppressed. It's much more emotionally difficult to acknowledge the ways that you have privilege you didn't earn, to acknowledge the ways that uh, you, whether or not you explicitly engaged in some oppressive behavior, are enjoying the fruits of it just by virtue of having been born into a particular category. Very difficult to wrestle with this. I think that's a piece of what's going on here. Next, uh, 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 ecofeminist uh, scholars, feminist scholars, including both uh, white ecofeminist scholars and, and ecofeminists of color, have sort of extended this idea of intersectionality to also include environment and, to greater or lesser degrees, depending on who you talk to, animals. I see, everybody here sees the animals that is there, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, the smart, the, 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 the idea that mostly gets used to talk about this uh, and I find very useful is, is an idea by a woman called Val Plumwood. She talks about the logic of domination. And uh, what she talks about is how these, uh, so, so it's not just that all these things intersect, but that they're structured in the same way. And in Western culture, 
which uh, uh, the uh, European conquest of the Americas and Europe and Asia and the ongoing neocolonialism has spread around the world. Uh, the Western mindset is based on these dualisms, male and female, and male's better than female. It's always dualisms, they're opposite each other, and one's better than the other. Male and female, white and non-white, human and animal, nature and culture, oh no, culture and nature, uh, uh, reason and emotion, spirit and body. And the insight of this is it's not just that we tend to see this world in these dualisms, <clears throat> abolition and welfare, um, <laughs> not just that we tend to see the world in these dualisms that are factually inaccurate and set the stage for subordination, but that the things on each side of the equation get linked to each other. And so males, white males are presumed to be more rational Women are presumed to be more uh, uh, emotional. People of color have variously been attributed various characteristics that are closer to nature. If you want to put down some group, whether it be women or an ethnic group or a racial group, you, you call them animal names. Yes? So the idea is that this is this web, but not a good kind. Um, and again, that we're all in this mixed position. I mean, we're all obviously disadvantaged by being born into a world where you come into the world with um, industrial chemicals in your umbilical cord blood that mess up your body before you even got the chance to take a breath. So we're all obviously disadvantaged from this. But many of us walk around with considerable privilege based on our race based on our nationality. And to the degree to which we look away from that, we are colluding with the system. The very system that we may be in our activism trying to do something about. So we're, we're trying to do something about the subordination of animals, but the subordination of animals exists within this whole system that where the different parts support each other. And, and, and if we're colluding with that system at the same time as we're trying to jiggle this one piece of it free, it's just not going to work. So what are some of the common elements of oppression? I'm so glad that they all covered most of them. Um, uh, 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 we've got the, 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 the making of living beings, whether they be people, non-human animals, or the earth herself, into property to be sliced and diced and sold for profit. Two, big one, control of reproduction. Control of reproduction. And three, one thing that really helps to maintain it, and I've never focused on before when, I, when I've talked at this conference, but I really want to focus on today, privilege. The privilege of the people on the upside of any particular dynamic. And privilege is insidious because it only works, especially in a democracy where people like to think of themselves as good people, it only works if it is mostly invisible to the people who have it. It's not comfortable to walk around thinking, hey, I'm walking on the backs of enslaved children, or, 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 or simply to acknowledge that you might have gotten your job uh, because of the racial bias of an interviewer who, before you ever knew it, weeded out the resumes uh, from Lakeisha Jones and interviewed you because your name is Mary Smith instead. You didn't see that racism, but you may be living, you probably are walking around with a little extra change in your pocket because of it. So what I'm here to tell you, particularly on the issue of race, because that just doesn't get talked about enough here, uh, uh, is um, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but unless you, if you're white, and, and you've not made a serious effort to figure out the role that white privilege plays in your life, 
you've got some sleepless nights ahead of you. And, and, and if you approach the process with the same authenticity that you approached divesting yourself of species privilege, it will be anguishing. You will start to see things you didn't even realize before. But you can do it, because you did it already with regard to animals. You can do this. It, will, it, it is not easy. It is sickening. It is revolting. You will feel physically ill. But you must. You've done, and I know you can. This is the, I know you can. So, so what I'm here to say. Oh, oh, and here's another thing that makes it harder. So it's hard for everybody because it is literally revolting. I remember when I went through this period of confronting white privilege, I felt like I was poisoned when I was walking around for, for, for it had to be six months. Um, uh, 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 but it's even harder for animal advocates. Uh, Native American scholar, activist, and vegetarian Andrea Smith has a really smart thing that she talks about uh, 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 in terms of how come white animal advocates have such a hard time uh, on race. And it's this. She says, and she's right, that, um, that white animal advocates, no, all animal advocates, we tend to identify with whoever we're advocating for, yes? In most social justice movements, we're advocating for ourselves, right? Queers are advocating for themselves, et cetera. Some people do solidarity work. But um, animal advocates are advocating for animals, and we tend to identify with those animals. Hmm? And the animals, as Lisa pointed out, they're the only ones who aren't oppressing anybody else, right? And so the animal advocate comes to feel like they're in that position of the most oppressed who isn't possibly oppressing anybody else. Does that make sense? Right? And so, and, and so, you know, what you just have to remember, like, like, is, no, you're not a hen in a battery cage. You're, you're, you're not a hen locked up in a battery cage. You're not a sow locked up in a gestation crate, but you are a white person in a country where people of color are locked up behind bars disproportionately. Both are true. Once you see your privilege, then you can begin to be smart about it. One, do whatever you can to divest yourself of it. Two, use it in useful ways, right? Um, I, uh, men who have male privilege, uh, men tend to talk more in groups and, and people listen to them more um, and, and, and people, so men in groups, for example, can divest themselves of a little bit of their male privilege if, if just the men are talking and everybody's only listening to the men. A man can, divest, can use his privilege by speaking to invite a woman to speak, right? So, so I, I've been talking about race, but it's, it's class, it's sex, it's all that too. Okay. I'm out of time, I'm sure. So, um, obviously we need to do these things for several reasons. One, uh, numbers. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, 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 there's a lot of people in the world, like seven billion now, um, and a really tiny number of them are white middle class Americans. Um, and, 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 and even within the United States, vegans are a relatively small group. If there's all this, we're aiming to totally overturn the whole basis of the economy. I think we need more people. <laughs> and so paying attention to these things will help us to get more people, to be, more, not to get more people, to be more people. Also, uh, 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 advocacy, whether it's, it's, it's for veganism or against some form of animal abuse, it's always much more effective when it's done by people within a particular community. Uh, and so we need to be in every community. Um, and, but it's not just that. And it's not just because all of this theoretical stuff about the links is true. It's true, but it's because, you know what, it's, you know this. You know this because of why you became vegan. It's wrong. It's wrong to enjoy the fruits of the violation of somebody else without at least making some small affirmative effort to divest yourself of that or do something about the violence. 
and, and, and the more that you sincerely are doing that, whatever it is, the much better you'll be able to do it everything else. Okay, the upside of it all is this. Lauren's talking to you about the, uh, the women who couldn't, the, the, the people who couldn't cook for their vegan kids. I just spent three years taking a break from direct animal work, work teaching at, the, uh, uh, teaching at community colleges in Minneapolis. Can't tell you how many homeless people talk to me about their struggle for being, uh, uh, struggle to stay vegan while they're homeless. I can't tell you how many, uh, 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 I was teaching low income folks, mostly people of color, I was teaching women's studies. I always integrated the animals, always. And not only did nobody object, but every semester people came up to me, made time to specifically thank me for including the animals. There is so much openness when it's done within a true understanding of how this is all connected. There is so much more openness. Uh, uh, it's almost as though we've been the mainstream is not the majority, right? You know this, right? The so-called mainstream is not the majority. Add up all the people outside the mainstream, that's the majority? Okay, so when we target our message here, we're doing like maybe the exact opposite of what we need to do because it's the folks who are oppressed by the system who are most best able to see the intersections between their own and have the motivation to help us throw down the system. You see what I'm saying? All right, so the upside of this, the two upsides are, one, if we do this, we actually have a chance of doing what we're setting out to do, and two, you're actually able to do it, because I know that even though it's difficult to do, you've already done an analogous thing when you confronted your species privilege. And, and so I'm just going to trust that that's what you'll do. Thank you so much. <laughs>